the book of Matthew looking at the Sermon on the Mount. And as we go through the Sermon on the Mount, we come this morning to a passage that deals with issues, quite honestly, that hit us all in the heart. Because we, we come to a passage that deals with loving our enemies. And this is not something that's natural to us. Instead, it's something that, quite honestly, takes a supernatural something that occurs in our life to do that. Jesus teaches on this in Matthew 5, 43 uh, for, through 48, and it says this, and let's read it together now to respect for the word of God. Let's stand, if we may, together. Matthew 5, 43 through 48. You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies, bless those who curse you, do good to those who hate you, and pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you, that you may be the sons of your Father in heaven, for he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good, and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what reward have you? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet your brethren only, what do you do more than others? Do not even the tax collectors do so? Therefore, you shall be perfect, just as your Father in heaven is perfect. Matthew 5, 43 through 48. Heavenly Father, guide us now in your word to bring us to a point of submission and love to you. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. As I was preparing for this message, uh, I came across a sermon that was preached on November 17th, 1957. And as I read the introduction to this uh, sermon, I went, wow, how powerful that is even today. Let me read you part of the introduction from this message. Currently and certainly, these are great words, words lifted to cosmic proportions. And over the centuries, many persons have argued that this is an extremely difficult command. Many would go so far as to say that it, it just isn't possible to move out into the actual practice of this glorious command. They would go on to say that this is just additional proof that Jesus was an impractical idealist who never quite came down to earth. So the arguments abound. But far from being an impractical idealist, Jesus has become the practical realist. The words of this text glitter in our eyes with a new urgency. Far from being the pious injection of a utopian dreamer, this command is an absolute necessity for the survivor, survival of our civilization. Yes, it is love that will save our world and our civilization. Love even for enemies. Now let me hasten to say that Jesus was very serious when he gave this command. He wasn't playing. He realized that it's a hard thing to love your enemies. He realized that it's difficult to love those persons who seek to defeat you, those persons who say evil things about you. He realized that it was painfully hard, pressingly hard, but he wasn't playing. And we cannot dismiss the passage as just another example of oriental hyperbole, just a sort of exaggeration to get over the point. This is a basic philosophy of all that we hear coming from the lips of our master, because Jesus wasn't playing because he was serious. We have the Christian and moral responsibility to seek to discover the meaning of these words and to discover how we can live out this command and why we should live out, should live by this commandment. These words were spoken by Martin Luther King Jr. at Dexter Avenue Baptist Church in Montgomery, Alabama, 17 November 1957. Very powerful words. You know, here Jesus is in this passage trying to correct the, the teaching of the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the rabbis. This is the sixth and final illustration that he uses where he says, 
you have heard it said, and then he corrects it. But I say unto you this. Uh, we understand that the Pharisees and Sadducees and, and the rabbis were, were teaching principles that were not in congruence with what Jesus himself would have us to do and to believe. And, and nowhere is it more seen the, this divergence than in this passage where it talks about love, the essential nature of God and our response to him, which is to love one another. We look at these words from our own pious condition and say, yeah, Jesus, you're right. But, but when I examine my heart down in the depths, I have to admit that I'm no different from the rabbis, the Pharisees, the Sadducees of Je Jesus' day. Because when I see my enemy suffer, I gloat. When I think of my enemies, I have to say, yeah, I hate them. And, and I like to devise plots against them and think of how good it would be just to beat the crud out of them. Did I say that in church? But isn't the truth with all of us? Well, while we condemn the Pharisees, the Sadducees, are we any different? Don't we despise those who despise us? Uh, don't we have enemies and that, that we would love to see fall on their face and we'd be able to stand over them with pious, sanctimonious attitudes of, you deserved it. That's not what Jesus wants. What Jesus demands of us as believers is to love. To love people, even our enemies. Now, the passage that they originally got this teaching from is a very familiar concept that, that we know. It's, it's, a, it's taught throughout the Old Testament that we are to love our neighbor. You know, it comes specifically from Leviticus 19.18. It says this, You shall not take vengeance nor bear any grudge against the children of your people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. Now, it's very interesting. The context of this passage deals with enemies, people we're striving with, people that we struggle with. And the entire context is love your neighbor, especially the one who is against you, who stands against you, who opposes you in all things. This causes people problems. You remember when the young lawyer came to Jesus in, in Luke 10, and he asked him the question, uh, what's the greatest of the commandment? And you know the answer. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. Love your neighbor as yourself. And that causes the, the lawyer to ask the question, who is my neighbor? And Jesus uses the, the parable of the good Samaritan. And who was the most despised, hated person under Judaism at this time? It, it was the Samaritans. And so he brings the context of Leviticus 19.18 back into play. We are to love our neighbors, love our enemies. But that's difficult. As a matter of fact, the Pharisees didn't like that so much. They added something to the teaching, which is hate your enemies. Now, I've got a little question for you. Where do you find this in the Bible where it says, hate your enemies? Anybody know? I want to see how many liars are in here. Because you don't find it. There is nowhere in Scripture where it says to hate your enemies. What had the teachers done? They had perverted the teaching that God was trying to communicate. Now, I'm sure they had justification to add this. I mean, they could say, hey, listen. When God sent us into the promised land, he told us to wipe out all the Canaanites. Kill them all. See, you're to hate your enemies. Wait, 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 wait. God said kill them all because he wanted them to be obliterated because they would teach Israel false worship. It's a different issue. Well, 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 maybe you got me on that one, they would say, but 
But look at all the imprecatory prayers of the psalm. Do you know what an imprecatory prayer is? You read the psalms and it says, May his wife be a widow. By the way, what does that just say? Kill him. May his children be fatherless. That's an imprecatory prayer. That's asking for God's justice. See, you're to hate your enemies. Well, understand there is a time to call for justice. But be careful when we do this. Because let's be careful that we're not asking justice for them and mercy for me. Okay? And I don't think they had validity in calling upon us to love your neighbor and hate your enemy. It is not there. God's purpose for all of us is to love people. Why? John 3, 16, For God so loved this sin-sick, enemy-fied world, oh, I added a few words, that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believed in Him should not perish but have eternal life. What is God's example? God's example is one of love. When we hated Him, He loved us. When we were yet enemies of His, He came to earth, and died for us. So Jesus corrects the teaching. He says this. He says two things in verses 44. Now, if you read in your text, there may be four or five things, but I'll explain that in just a second. There's really only two things. First, he says this, love your enemies. This is a scriptural mandate, and we see it throughout the Old Testament. You look in passages such as Deuteronomy 22, 1 through 4, where it talks about you're out and about and you see your enemy's cattle. It's gotten out. It's on its own. Now, you might think, well, here's my enemy's livestock. I will take it for myself. I'll kill it. I'll really show him. But in Deuteronomy, it says specifically, when you see your enemy's cattle, you take it in, shelter it, and when your enemy comes, you give it to them. Wow, what what principle is it teaching? You treat your enemy with respect, with dignity, and with love. You read in other passages like Proverbs 25, 21, if your enemy hungry is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him to drink. The point is this, the Old Testament teaching was not that we hate our enemy. The entire teaching is you love those who persecute you. And Scripture is filled with examples of this. The the one that I use all the time, Joseph. Here his brothers hated him. They were his enemies. They were going to kill him eventually decided to make a profit, instead sold him into slavery. And when he had opportunity to get back at them, what did he do? He showed them mercy and forgiveness. He loved his brothers, though his brothers did not love him. And and we can go to many other examples. You, You look at David, when his son, who tried to kill him and usurped the throne, Absalom, is killed. What does he do? He weeps over him. He loved his enemies. And and what his commander-in-chief told him, he says, David, you love your enemies and hate your friends. What David was just demonstrating love. And what God wants us to do is to love. That is not our natural tendency when people come after us. Now, I know you're all beautiful people. I know that you don't have an enemy in the world. Ha, ha, ha. Every one of us has people that don't like us. For some reason, I don't understand it. I mean, shouldn't they love me? I'm just so lovable. But are we? What happens is that we all have enemies. We all have people that are against us, that don't like us, that stand in our way. And our tendency is when we have the opportunity, we take it to show vengeance 
and revenge. And that is not what God wants us to do. We build walls. Walls that prevent us from communicating. A refusal to do what God would have us to do. And even we as Christians get caught up in it. We, we hide behind the masquerade of, of Christianity. And we fail to love the very people that God would have us to love. God wants us to love our enemies. Additionally, not only that, He wants us to pray for those who persecute you. Now, in some of your Bibles, there's some extraneous material there. It says, bless those who cursed you, do good to them that hate you, and etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. If you look in the oldest and best manuscript, those words are not there. They were probably added at a later day. And the only thing that we are absolutely sure of is the two statements. Love your enemies, pray for those who persecute you. Do you know why you need to pray for those who persecute you? That's a hallmark of self-control. To pray for them. And I'm not talking about praying those imprecatory prayers. You know, smite them about the head and shoulders. This is praying for their blessing, for their benefit. That is really an expression of genuine love. You know, I find it hard to pray for some of the people that have hurt me. You know, it's interesting. When I look at my own life, I have been hurt the most and the deepest, not by non-Christians. I expect them to treat me terrible. I've been hurt the most by Christians. I've been denied promotions that I felt I deserved because of ungodly and unrighteous behavior. Hey, I, I even was denied the opportunity to be a pastor at one church because I told a bald-headed joke to a bald-headed man. And they said that was very inappropriate. Um, you look at it and you go, why? The pain that I have suffered in my own life makes it very difficult for me to, to look upon those who have hurt me, persecuted me, denied me, said things about me falsely, that I just don't want anything good to happen to them. I'll be honest. But Jesus says, that's the very thing you need to do. Christendom, who is one of the early church historians and writers, said that prayer is the highest summit of self-control. And where we are most brought into conformity is when we pray for our persecutors. Bonhoeffer, in his Cost of Discipleship, says, this is the supreme demand. Through the medium of prayer, we go to our enemy, stand by his side, and plead for him to God. Wow. How can we do that? What's our motivation? How can we be motivated to do that? Well, Jesus gives us the motivation right here. Three things he points out. First, the rationale. The rationale is act like who you are. Do you know who you are? Do you really know? When you become a Christian, do you know who you are? You become a son of God. And you know what Jesus is saying? Act like a son of God. Oh, by the way, what did the Son of God do for His enemies? I've already told you. He came to earth and died for us while we were yet sinners. And so how does a Son of God act? A Son of God acts in love towards His enemies. That's what Jesus did. And because we're sons of God, act like who you are as parents. Don't we ever say to our kids, or have you ever said to your kids, act like a grown-up, or you're grown up and you need to act like it, or you know something to that effect, or you're a rushing, therefore act like rushing's act, you know something to that effect. What are we saying to our kids? Be who you were brought up to be. 
And the rationale that Jesus uses for us is we need to love our enemies because we're a son of God, and that's what sons of gods do. Wow. That's tough, isn't it? But that's what he says. Live up to our parentage. Additionally, there's great reward. The reward that Jesus gives us is we receive from what we do. Now, here's something put in your thinking cap. Choose your enemies carefully. You know why? You become just like them. Did you catch that? Choose your enemies carefully because you become just like them. You know what your reward is if you treat your enemies like enemies and not out of love? If they treat you with disdain, what's your tendency? Treat them with disdain. They say something bad about you, what do you do? You say something bad about them. What's your reward? You receive from what you do. And if you treat your enemies horribly, you've got your reward. You've become just like them. Be careful. God will reward you. J. Oswald Sanders says, The master expects from his disciples such conduct as can be explained only in the terms of the supernatural. You know how we can love? Because we have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. And He supernaturally empowers us with the ability to love our enemies, even when we don't feel like it or when we want to. The third motivation that we have, not only the rationale, the reward, but the result, is it completes what you will be. It says this, By loving, we become perfect. Perfect that which is in us. Uh, The word perfect does not mean perfect. You go, huh? The the Greek word that's used here, teleos, is the word that Jesus used on the cross when he said, it is perfect. Oh, he didn't say it is perfect. He said what? It is finished. Yet the word there is the exact same word. The word is not perfection in all of its complexities. It's you complete what you started. It's the word that we would often use for maturity. When you love your enemies, you're becoming mature. And when you hate your enemies, all it shows is you're still a babe in Christ. That's all you are. But when you're able to love them, then you are completing, perfecting that which work which God has begun in you. That's our challenge, to love our enemies. If I were to ask each and every one in here, do you know one person in your life that you would consider an enemy? I'm not saying someone who would shoot at you. I'm saying maybe somebody who's speaks evil of you, who doesn't like you. Uh, Your hair color is wrong. Your eye color is wrong. Your skin color is wrong. The way you talk is wrong. I bet each and every person in here could think of at least one person that you would consider an enemy in that sort. What would God have us to do with that person? Love them. And here's how we change. This is what we do. How's my life going to be different as a result of this? I need to learn to love those people that are my enemies. That's the way I become mature and perfect in Jesus Christ. How do we do that? Uh, There's things that we need to do. We need to first examine ourselves. Jesus, a little bit later in, in Matthew 7, 3, in the Sermon on the Mount, says that before we take the speck out of someone else's eye, we better do what? Take the beam out of our own eyes? 
And so one of the things that we have to do in this process of learning to love our enemies is to realize that, you know, maybe I'm not perfect. I know that's hard to believe, but maybe I'm not. Uh, maybe, maybe I have some flaw in this entire area. And maybe there's some issues in my life that, that need to be changed. And, and maybe I've had a DRA. That's a dirty, rotten attitude in regard to these things. And, and maybe I need to do something different. You know, we have to not only look at ourselves in this regard, you know, we have to examine our enemies in the same light. You know, maybe they're not all bad. Maybe God brought them into my life for for purpose to train and teach me things that I couldn't learn otherwise. And, And so maybe I need to look at them in a different light. And and by so doing, can, can begin to understand. We have to understand this that hatred destroys me. Did you catch that? Hate distorts the personality of the hater. We usually think of what hate does for the individual who's hated, or the individuals hated, or the groups hated. But it is even more tragic, it is even more ruinous, and interest to the individual who hates. Again, the words of Martin Luther King Jr. We got to examine ourselves and see what damage, what flaws are here. I think a second thing we need to do is we need to pray for our enemies. We need to pray for them. I mean, that's what he said, didn't it? Pray for your enemies. Pray for their welfare. Pray for their healing and restoration. If they're in sin, pray that they would repent. That God would heal them and restore blessing to them. You know what I've learned is that most of our enemies, the reason there are enemies is they want to be loved. And all they're looking for is someone to love them. And the reason that we hate people is we need to be loved. And so one of the ways that we can begin doing that is praying for other people for God's blessings and in so doing, what is God prone to do to us? Give us blessing. (coughs) It's interesting when I look at this phrase that's used, love your enemies, pray for your enemies. The Greek word that is used there for love is the Greek word agape a word that most of us are very familiar with. It doesn't say like your enemies. It says this is the highest word of love, unselfish concern for the well-being of our enemies. That's hard. But again, we can only do it in the power of the Spirit. And that's where we have to be very, very persistent in that. And we discipline ourselves to pray for their welfare, not their they're hurt. Third thing, we need to redeem our enemies. Redeem them. How do you redeem them? Well, understand this, that love heals hurts. Love builds up the other person. The example I've heard is that of Abraham Lincoln and Edwin Statton. Uh, Statton and Lincoln were running for president at the same time, and to get elected, Stanton was saying all sorts of bad things about Abraham Lincoln, horrible things. When Lincoln became president and was in need of a secretary of war, he called all his advisors together. He says, who should we nominate and who should we put? And they discussed a number of names. And Lincoln finally said, we need to appoint Edwin Statton. And everybody says, you're crazy, man. This is a guy who opposed you, who said all sorts of bad things about you. And he says, yes, but he's the best man for the job. 
So he appointed Edwin Stanton his Secretary of War, which was one of his brilliant moves. And Stanton became not an enemy, but one of his staunchest friends. When he died, it was Edwin Stanton who made the famous statement, now he belongs to the ages. He redeemed him. He brought him back. And that's what we need to do to our enemies. We are all going to face opposition in this life. We're all going to have enemies. And when we face our enemies, we can do one of three things. We can hate them. And if we hate them, you know what we'll do? We'll fight. We'll use the same tactics. We'll resort to violence or verbal or whatever. And we end up becoming just like our enemy. Our we can cower, which is we give in. You know, it's like Israel coming out of Egypt. Oh, let us go back to the land of leeks and onions. We cave in. Or we can be victorious and love. Love conquers. Love conquers. We refuse to be reduced to the level of our enemy. We refuse to retreat. And we do the only thing that can change people. We love them. And we conquer through love. We never allow another person to cause us to hate them. Instead, we rise above it and we love them in spite of their imperfections. It was Martin Luther King who also said, I would rather die than hate you. Would you join me in prayer?